Hey, growers from around the world, Jordan River here. Thanks for tuning in to Growcast today. Quick reminder, you can win some free People Under the Stairs seeds. The great people at People Under the Stairs Genetics, it's a lot of people, uh, they are giving away seeds to our wonderful listeners. That's you folks. So if you would like to win some free seeds, simply rate and review Growcast, take a snapshot, and email it to contact at growcastpodcast.com. Make sure to check out People Under the Stairs Genetics. They're up at uh, Harvest Mutual and many other places. They've got some great chem lines. Really, really generous of them. And two lucky reviewers are going to walk away with seeds. Maybe more, depending on the response we receive. Today, we have Terp Fiend on the line. Speaking of breeders, uh, Terp Fiend is great. Everyone loves Terp Fiend. This is his second appearance. And I know you're going to love everything he has to say about his new lines, breeding advice, and much, much more. Before we get started, let's give some love to... Truly one of my favorite partners, Sohum Soil. We love Ellis Smith and Sohum Soils. Find them at SohumSoils.com. Promo code GROWCAST10 gets you 10% off your Sohum Soil. And members of MyGrowPass.com get 20% off site-wide. Sohum Soils was created to take the thinking out of growing clean, quality, organic cannabis. With all the liquid fertilizer on the market, growers can be afraid to try and be a chemist when mixing nutrients. No need for that with Sohum. Just add plain water. You don't even need to pH it. It's truly one of the best super soil options out there. You just order it right to your door. You add plain water. That's it. They've got a great chart to show you the proper size container you need to use. Uh, Maybe add some of your own microbes, but they also make sure that the soil comes with beneficial bacteria and fungus, as well as all the micro and macronutrients that your plant needs. Set it and forget it. It's that easy. Sohumsoils.com, promo code GROWCAST10, mygrowpass.com for 20% off and more. Also, shout out to Canna Planners. We've been talking about Canna Planners. We get asked a lot about cannabis businesses starting their own website. Cannaplanners.com is where you need to go. Make sure you mention Growcast. For all your cannabis website needs, for all of your SEO needs, Cannaplanners.com. Tell them Growcast sent you. Let's jump in with Terp Fiend, everyone. Thank you for listening and enjoy the program. Hello, podcast listeners. You are now listening to Growcast. I'm your host, Jordan River, and I want to thank you for tuning in today. Before we get started, share Growcast. Always share Growcast with a friend, with a smoker, with a grower. It's how we grow as a cast. Thank you for subscribing and rating and reviewing. And make sure to subscribe to the Homegrown Helpers for more growing talk and the Coffee Health and Science Podcast, my other show. Today, we have a breeder feature, and we've truly come full circle. Terp Fiend is on the line. How you doing, Terp Fiend? Hey, how's it going, Jordan? Going very, very well, my friend. The reason I say we've come full circle, I believe... Maybe the listeners can correct me if I'm wrong. I believe that Terp Fiend, you were the first breeder feature we ever did on the show back before we even titled the episodes breeder features. Um, you were the first kind of, you know, breeder with your own following who I had on the show to talk about your line, to talk about breeding. It spawned this new episode where we've now we've spoken to, I don't know, over a dozen different breeders with all these different attitudes, you know, all these different styles, all these different focus points. Very, very interesting. And it all started with you, man. So I appreciate you. Uh, a year, almost a year ago now, and then again coming on the show today. Thank you, buddy. Man, thank you, Jordan. An easy start. I just want to say a huge shout out to your crowd. You have a, an, an amazing group of people that follow you and that follow your podcast. Um, after the first time we did it, I probably picked up a few thousand followers. And generally speaking, they're knowledgeable. They ask great questions. They're people that are engaged in the sport of growing. They're very, very, very cognizant of what's going on and what the trends are and what's new. Um, I, oh, you know, I, I appreciate that. Really, That's incredible. Really a ton of great growers and just really interested people from doing the podcast the first time. And that's why I really feel blessed to be back to talk. <laughs> I love it. Absolutely love it, man. Let's catch up first on your side, what you've been working on. I see you've got a bunch of new strains coming out. Last we spoke, you were dropping the whole chunky lemon tree line and you've gone quite a quite a bit further from that. Uh, I saw you drop some lime, some have already sold out, but just talk to us about what you've been working on and what you're working on now. Yeah, for sure. So since then, we did the Orange Head Rush line, which is a Orange Skittles 501st OG deep chunk 
Um, the, the one of the trends that we'll see through the afternoon of discussing is that I still work heavily with deep chunk as much as I can. Um, it's a strain that to me has produced tons of medicinal benefits since the first time I ran it in the early 2000s. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm a big fan of the, the, the Mersine heavy cushions and it's one of the ones that's right up there for me personally. Mm-hmm. Um, it's also a really good breeding strain. It tends to add you know, really chunky, heavy resin. Um, it, you know, it's a strain that generally is fairly true breeding so that when you're using it, you kind of know what each parent's bringing to the party. Um, and it's one that I've had a lot of good times using and running, and I, I find a good response to it. Mm-hmm. Um, most recently, we dropped the Royal Goo line which is an Afgu Long Valley Royal Kush. And we're kind of keeping the trend up of heavy cushions, to be honest. Um, that's one that I did a round of well before we did the Chunky Lemon Tree. Um, and I've kind of gone back to it to do another round of crosses and another round of F2s so we can kind of share the original pure line with people. Um, I also, in that line, we did a back cross to the original Long Valley Royal Kush, which to me... Um, it's just kind of reinforcing those Kush traits in that pure line as mm. much as we can. Um, and then we did a bunch of outcrosses with um, uh, the cereal mi- milk, um, the Katsu Bubba Harawana IBL, and a Lemon Royale from uh, Swamp Boys. And um, nice. you know, that, what, what I'm trying to do is once again kind of take different flavors infuse them with that heavy cush to get that medicinal property that so many of us are looking for. Um, I kind of feel like we've almost bred out the heavy indica because we've got so many people that love these sativa leaning hybrids, which don't get me wrong. Love them. Love I'm them. with you, Terp. I'm with you, buddy. I'm a heavy indica guy. Like I, I like to feel my weed on my eyelids. Like it's <laughs> one of those things that, you know, I've always enjoyed heavy cushes and heavy indicas. Um, and it's something that in my work, I tend to try to, I, I have a lot of people ask me for sativa hybrids and I have to kind of improvise in the moment and kind of find them something that leans a little sativa. Right. Most everything I have is almost all heavy cushions and heavy indica lines. Sure um, thing, man. I'm a big fan of it, that. It, it's what works for me, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, you didn't bring up one thing that I was interested in was your Mecha Godzilla. Oh yeah, those went fast. <laughs> yeah, are those sold out now? <laughs> yeah, those sold out quick. Um, and I and I kind of knew it would. You know, it's it's a really hype. The Sunset Sherbet Wedding Cake. Um, the Seed Junkie stuff is really hot right now. Um, people love all of the wedding cake crosses. Um, I'm a and big I can't fan win, of that wedding cake. Yeah, you know, they're, they're absolutely frosty. Once again, a lot of those tend to lean really heavy indica. Um, and, and they really have a lot of profile that people like, um, but yeah, those went really fast. Now coming up, I've got a new line that we're about to drop. It's a 706 skunk line. The 706 skunk is a 91 chem deep chunk crossed to a skunk number one. Um, I've worked with kind of two different plants out of this. One is a more skunky kind of poopy smelling the heavy poop peens. And then the other is kind of a sweeter one, which I've done a little less work with. The line that I'm about to release, the 706 Skunk line, I've got our wedding cake crossed to 706 Skunk, which my hope there is to kind of have that cakey, gassy that everybody loves, but with a really skunky, poopy oh, bottom. Oh, man. I love me and, some skunk. I'm excited for that line. And, and I've got a 706 Skunk F2 that we're releasing as well. So we have a pure line there that, you know, people that just want that skunk. It's really big right now. There's a lot mm. of contention within the skunk community, I suppose. Sure. Um, just as far as I think there's a lot of people chasing a skunk from, you know, the back in the day. Decades ago, there maybe. Were, there's a, Yeah, and there's, there's a lot of people looking for that heavy skunk profile right now. Um, it's something that people have asked me for a ton, and it's something that, you know, let's be honest, everybody loves. Um, <laughs> I grew up in the South. So for me, we ran skunks for years and years and years. And it was almost a strain that we got sick of. Um, And it's something that having gone back 
to seeds that I worked with years and years ago, it's something that I'm trying to kind of put back into my rotation a little bit. That's cool, man. That's really cool. Returning to your roots and then uh, doing lots of collabs too. You mentioned the Swamp Boys. They're out of uh, where? Florida, if I'm not mistaken? Uh, That wasn't necessarily a collab. That was really just me using their seeds, to be honest with you. But we do... We do a ton of collabs. Um, I try to work with smaller breeders who are kind of trying to make a name for themselves. Nice. Um, I've kind of found that a, there's a lot of people right now that want to make seeds and want to work with seeds. Um, to me, I've always tried to encourage anybody and everybody to make seeds. Um, I've said before, I don't look at Paul and Chucker as a bad thing. <laughs> I think every person out there should make some seeds with their two favorite plants and see what happens. And that's how we really expand the gene pool. And that's how we eventually find ridiculously new and unique profiles that we haven't seen before. I like that attitude, man. Love your whole breeder philosophy. Um, I, I really, I really am a fan. I appreciate it, Jordan. And like I said, man, for me, it's really about trying to get back to uh, just finding something unique, trying to, trying to dig in and find new strains and new varieties and new flavors that maybe we haven't exploited to death yet. Um, and really trying to make flavors available to everybody so that as these new states go legal, people that have seen these strains in high times or on Instagram or on the internet, they can finally have a chance to grow some of these flavors that they've heard about or that they've seen. And I always try when people hit me up specifically looking for a suggestion of a strain, the first thing I always ask is what kind of flavors are you into? Because I try to pair strains with people based on what their their flavor profile is. Mm -hmm. Uh, As much as I I also like to kind of breed for effect and, uh, you know, for medicinal qualities, for me, it's all about taste and it's all about flavor and it's all about turps. Right. And, so, and I'll tell you, the other thing is we're realizing how closely connected those are, right? Like yeah, you're saying, absolutely. I mean, the mercine is the flavor we're after, but it's also going to drive the, uh, the effect of the high. So I've actually been absolutely. recommending, uh, we just put out a great resource for our members talking about, are you trying to choose what strain to grow next? You know, maybe sativa and indica, which is just, you know, basically observations of the plant. How fat are the leaves? Absolutely. Maybe that's not the best. Maybe you should instead be focusing on terpenes. And we gave a couple of lists of terpenes and strains that are high in them. So I love, I love that attitude. And that's why you are the terp fiend. Uh, or as <laughs> I've been saying, terp find. I'm not sure why, but that's, that is my nickname for you. Uh, everyone follow terp fiend, T-E-R-P underscore F-I-3 N-D, terp fiend on Instagram. And that's where you can get at them. Um, did you have a? Did you want to wrap up that thought there, Terpenes? Oh yeah, you you kind of hit on something that I think is really underappreciated right now, and I think it's a great misconception within the cannabis industry. Um, sativa and indica are literally descriptors that describe how the plant looks. Right. That's it. So the notion that sativas make you peppy and that indicas make you go to sleep is really wrong. Right. And it's entirely based on kind of misinformation that we've all kind of passed along through the years. So I always tell people the stoniest weed that I ever had in my life was a land race tie. Oh, it hell yeah. As, That's a great as example. Sativa as you could possibly describe a plant, right. tall, lanky, narrow buds, narrow leaves, but it literally had the most sedative profile that I've ever had in my life. So the reality is it comes down to terpenes and that's what we're learning more and more is that what defines your high, what defines the effects generally has more to do with terpene profile and terpene levels than it does THC levels or CBD levels or ancillary cannabinoid levels that generally the effect of your high as much as it has to do with your set and your setting, you know, your mind frame, what you have for lunch. That's a good point. It's just equally about terpenes. Love it, man. Whether or not you're drinking some uh, coffee with it, right? That'll right. definitely. I'm always pairing my uh, my cannabis with coffee. We were thinking about doing a show on that. All right, before we jump back in with Terp Fiend, shout out to Dr. Zymes. DrZymes.com is where you can find it. D-O-C-T-O-R-Z-Y-M-E-S.com. Promo code GROWCAST10 for 10% off. 
It's MyGrowPass.com members getting 25% off their Dr. Zymes. You know Dr. Zymes. It's the revolutionary all-natural green solution that kills and eliminates insects, molds, and mildews without leaving any residue. It is not a toxic pesticide. It is an enzyme-based pest control product that is completely natural, and you can use it at any stage in the life cycle. Make sure to use it properly with its proper temperature and pH as it's crucial for this wonderful product, and you will see some great success. Growcast10 gets you 10% off. I do understand that they were having some trouble with their promo code, so please uh, forgive the uh, delay and check back often. But they are working on that. DrZymes.com. Growcast10 for 10% off. MyGrowPass.com for 25% off. Add Dr. Zymes to your pest control regimen today. DrZymes.com. Terp Fiend, listen, we could go a thousand different directions, but I think that what we absolutely <laughs> have to do is answer the questions that my listeners submitted on Instagram. We put up a post and we got some great questions. So, so let's jump into these, man. Um, yeah, let's do it. Real simple to begin with, multiple people were asking, how much space do you need to get started breeding? Um, that's kind of a loaded question because it comes down to what your goal is in the end. Um, I encourage anybody that's got a space where they can make seeds to make seeds. Um, you really don't need much more than a tent to make seeds. Now, if you're trying to do in-depth breeding, if you're trying to do multiple lines, if you're trying to do really anything that's going to be space intensive, the short answer is the more space, the better. But if you time things right, if you plan things right, if you have enough space to do a moderate selection you can breed really nice seeds with a couple tents a couple small rooms um, the real kicker is keeping pollen flow to a minimum and that's kind of your deciding factor is how many spaces can you come up with but still control your pollen absolutely um, will a tent next to another tent be able to control pollen or is there not, a... not well not oh, well wow. Uh, to be honest with you, tent next to tent is really not a good idea if you're doing open pollen where you're actually letting the plant pollinate the whole area. Um, if you're doing small, small scale, just dusting your plants, you can make that work. Um, it really comes down to kind of knowing how to pollinate plants without getting other plants. You have to isolate the plant. You have to do your pollination. When you're done with your pollination, you need to spray the plant down with water so you kill any dead or any extra pollen that might be floating around. Airborne, yeah, that's right. Right, and, and if you have proper procedures, you can do it in, in smaller areas. But I always tell people your best bet, if you only have one room or one, you know, one area, is to kind of focus on a couple of strains that you want to cross, kind of do smaller numbers, and then as you can expand, you can, you can get to larger numbers as you go. Um, you know... I don't want people to think that the only way that you can be a breeder is if you can do 500 to a thousand seeds at a time. That's, that's probably not, not how, necessary. yeah, that's, that's probably not how you got started. That's probably not how most people got started. Absolutely, absolutely not. You know, and, and to be brutally honest with people, that's nice. That's really nice, but it's not necessary. Um, mm. Doing your initial selection, it's always nice to have as many plants as you can. Um, there's a lot of factors as far as genetics that most people don't think about in making seeds, such as the actual seed itself. So not every mother plant is going to make beautiful, huge, perfectly ripe seeds. That's a trait that you need to look for. Oh, wow. Um, I didn't think and about the that. Large, yeah. I, I, it's something that you realize the more plants you run at once and the more different strains you run, you come to realize that some plants are going to put out smaller seeds. Some plants are going to put out bigger seeds. Some plants are going to put out darker seeds. Some plants are going to put out lighter seeds. It's all about finding that mother that kind of does everything. Mm. And that's what's really tough in doing smaller numbers is that you always want to be able to kind of see every variable that you can and have to guess as few as possible. Right. Um, part of being a breeder is being able to kind of see what you don't see is being able to guess what's going to happen without really being able to see it all the time. And sometimes the best way to do that is to run as many as you can, get a very good idea for what your entire population looks like, and then you can see those minute differences a little bit better. Man, that's that, this is really eye-opening. Um, 
it's it's so complex. I'm 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 happy that you encourage people to get into it, but it seems like you can go just about as deep as you want. Let me ask you this: When these people are asking about you know the way they phrase it, how much space to be a sincere breeder? Someone says how much space to do breeding projects like you do. Let me ask you: What is your uh, what does your space look like? Um, the grow that I've used for the past four or five years was sectioned into four different areas. Um, it essentially was roughly four lights per area. Did you frame it out? So it's like walls. It's completely done and all the ventilation went to different places so that you have absolutely no flow between the rooms. Um, it was essentially sectioned out and made just for breeding. That's um, I would use one area as veg and then kind of separate everything out and then use the plants that were in veg to flip and use those plants for that room as well. So I was able to use the, one of the rooms for veg at all times. Um, but I mean, once again, you know, and, and, and most people would say that some people would say that's probably not enough. Um, I've been able to make it work. I've been able to do the kind of selection that makes me feel comfortable with what I'm doing. Um, I've used plants generally to breed with that are plants that I've stress test tested that I've run before that I have a very good idea for what they're going to pass on and how they're going to behave. Um, and plants that I feel like I understand. And that's kind of the kicker is that once you've done those selections, you beat those plants up, you know what they're going to do and how they're going to perform then you don't need as much space. You don't need to do 500 plants every single run when you can find the plants that you need that you know are going to pass on what you need them to pass on. And that's why I encourage people to get their hands dirty, to run some seeds and to try it because the more you run your own plants and the more that you're able to give those plants multiple cycles, the more you're going to be able to see how they perform in every circumstance and what they're going to pass on to their children. It makes perfect sense. And like you said, it's interesting how you can get to know these cultivars like the back of your hand once you've had them enough times, right? Oh yeah, man. Uh, Yeah. They're like kids to me. You know, I I just had my first, my first actual child last year. um, And we were discussing that before we started Um, having watched him grow. Um, you kind of understand genetics a little bit differently because you get to see which traits he took from me, which traits so he took from the mother, exactly things, how things they behave. And how, yeah. Right, right. And how much of those things, uh, you know, we, as a breeder, we also get into the nature versus nurture. How much of it is genetic versus how much of it is the, the environment that they grow up in. And it applies for plants too. So different, but the same plant may express differently in different situations, in different grow conditions, in different lighting environments, in different air environments, in different nutritive environments. So that's the other thing is really seeing the true expression of your plants and knowing your plants as you use them as parents. Mm. Makes sense, man. I I, I absolutely love it. Uh, Does that wrap up the uh, space topic, do you feel? Um, yeah, that's about what I've got on that. To be honest, like I said, don't ever let a lack of space be a hindrance for you making seeds. Um, at the same time, if you're, you're serious about breeding and you're serious about taking it serious, um, generally as much space as you can get is the short answer. Um, but don't let that hinder you from making seeds, trying to breed your own seeds and, and being willing to get out there and get your hands dirty and learn. It's interesting. It's like a lifelong process. It almost sounds like uh, I'm I'm in I'm a semi pro poker player. It's like, uh, of course, if you can open multiple tables and increase your volume, if it's almost like increasing the volume of your plants, you're saying makes it easier because there's more variety. But that shouldn't stop you from getting started on just learning the game. Basically, doing Absolutely. one plant. Yeah, it's because because it is in fact a lifelong journey. I have the same question when people ask me, like, where do I get started with growing? What's the best resource to learn how to grow? And I tell people the best resource when learning how to grow is growcast. dirty fingernails. No, dirty <laughs> fingernails. And growcast. No, you're <laughs> no, I totally feel you, man. That's what I tell people too is get started, right? That's it. You get in there, get your hands dirty. You're going to fuck up a couple of times. You're going to fail a couple of times. But don't let that be a hindrance for doing it. Like, don't don't get so anxiety ridden about starting that you don't start. I love the it. The best thing you can do is learn, get a plant, learn how it works, find two plants that you love, 
bang them together, see what happens. <laughs> That's the best learning you can get aside from the grow cast. <laughs> exactly. I love it. <laughs> so listen, uh, uh, I've got my little grow going now. I'm super excited. We need to talk my friend so we can, uh, maybe get some terpene genetics in my tent. Um, oh, yeah. I do, I do want to do an auto. I have to do an auto flower run next. I, I did promise some folks. Sure. Anyways, me and Rizo Rich are, are talking about maybe taking, uh, taking a stab at breeding some strains. So I will be in touch with you, man. You've yeah. definitely inspired many of my listeners and personally me and, uh, one of my partners in Rizo Rich. Well, that brings me back to another one of my favorite topics, which is the open source genetics movement. Um, The one thing that I support more than anything is people using my genetics uh, to make their own strains. Um, There's a lot of contention in the breeding community about using other people's strains. Right. Um, You you seem to be doing well. (laughs) Yeah. I'm a firm believer that everything that I put out should be used by whoever purchases it. So if you buy seeds from me, what you do with them at that point is yours. It's, it's, you know, you own them. That's cool, um, I've never discouraged anyone from breeding my work and I encourage it as much as possible. I'll definitely get you some seeds that you can work with. Um, but you know, there's been so many people that have taken my advice, taken some of my strains, made their own seeds. And they're people that have learned you know, as much as they possibly can just by getting started and just by trying it. Um, I support that 100%. I wish more breeders had that same attitude. It doesn't take money out of my pocket. It doesn't make, it doesn't mean that I don't make money selling my seeds. But what it means is that once somebody's purchased them, they own them and they're theirs to work with. And I encourage people to take strains, my strains, other breeders' strains. If you find a plant that you love, and you want to be able to, to see how it would do to make seeds, please, by all means, try it. That's really cool, man. I don't know enough, to be honest, to kind of come down on one side of the uh, genetic sourcing, genetic patenting argument. But from yeah. my, what little I, you know, what little toe I have in the industry through my little podcast and my little home grow, I, I tend to agree with you. I, I really like that a lot just because I am a fan of open source and so many different applications. Again, I think there are smarter people who probably know more, but that's really cool, man. And I'll say I appreciate that as someone who's just getting started. So that's really as cool. we go forward, as we go forward, the thing that we're going to see is that these big companies, these big grows these big uh, industrial giants that are going to come into the industry as things get more and more legal, they're going to have no qualms about taking your strain. They're going to have no qualms about patenting your strain and owning your strain. The only way they cannot do that is if your strain is so common that they can't claim it as their (laughs) own and they can't prove that that strain belongs exclusively to them or was created exclusively by them. The more that we share these genetics, the more that we share the genetics that we love, the more that they become common and the less likely they're going to be to be taken by somebody that didn't create it. Now, once again, there may be people out there that know more than I do about the subject, but I understand. I kind of look at it as the same way I did uh, software in the 90s and the early 2000s or CDs and music in the late 90s. Um, You can't really control it to a certain degree. Um, I can't really control who, who does what with my strains. I can throw fits on the internet and try and hit people in public when I see them and get all angry, but that's not going to stop anybody from using my genetics. And, and I've, there are breeders out there that kind of take that approach. Um, to be honest with you, it's easier for me to just allow people to do it because to me, it makes sense to me, man. It, it, it all, it all ends up full circle. You know, I can't count how many people took my genetics, went and made something that may have been better than what I made. And then sent those seeds to me. And, and to me, there's, there's really no greater thing than seeing somebody else empowered to learn how to breed by taking my gear, making something new, and creating something. Mm. That's what it's all about, man. I, I, I totally agree with you. Something just popped into my head, though. I got to ask this. It's kind yep. of a left turn. Forgive me. Um, I'm growing from seeds. I've, I've, when I was living in Humboldt County, never had seeds, just got cuttings, as many cuttings as I want, would take cuttings for my own run for the next run, never pop seeds. Um, what I'm realizing is these differences in phenotypes, like the, these, these different expressions that the same strain will have. Um, that's really like surprising to me, man, that, that you could get a different pheno from a pack to where, or maybe I'm mistaken. Maybe you can correct me on that to where these seeds will 
um, grow differently from one another. I'm so used to a uniform crop. You know what I mean? Okay. So that kind of brings up another one of the questions that I think somebody asked on your question, on your, your, uh, on your Instagram. Post, yeah. That, yeah. That had something to do with kind of filial generations, what we call F1s, F2s, etc. Um, not too many people are using what I call true breeding parentage strains. There's a few, there's a few older breeders that have worked their lines long enough to have true breeding parents. Um, that's a lot more common in the big ag world than it is in the cannabis world. What is that like breeding with the same generational, generational, generational? (laughs) So essentially having two parents that are so far along in filial generations or in, in, in the breeding process that they breed true which means that nearly every one of their progeny will look almost ah, kind of like I was talking about as if you got a tray of cuttings. Correct. Correct. So what we kind of do is in the F1 generation, you're looking for variation. Your F1s and your F2s are generally going to be your most wide variation from those. You want to start to limit kind of what you're looking for. Um, but the notion that long filial generations is the only good stable seed is kind of not true. Um, we kind of look at it the same way we look at dog breeding. A lot of dog breeders have inbred plants and inbred, um, inbred dogs and inbred dogs to the point where you've got certain dog breeds that have been bred just to look a certain way, but now they have genetic traits that aren't necessarily so good. Oh yeah. And that health problems. Yeah. Right. That happens with cannabis. Unless oh. you're starting from wild genetics, an F12 or an F13 is almost not necessary and is almost gross overkill. And that's oh. why you don't see too many of those in, in the gene pool. At that point, you've inbred that plant to the point where you're probably going to deal with some not so good traits. If you're starting from plants that breed fairly true, it's also not necessary to go that deep just to get plants that all look God, identical. That's fascinating, man. Um, at this point, I don't have a lot of customers that ask me for that. Um, a lot of people that hit me up almost want to be able to find variation in their strains. They want to find right. something that's unique. They want to find something that's different. They want to find something that they feel like is theirs. Um, if you're popping a pack of seeds and everyone looks identical, you know what to expect. It's not all that exciting. You kind of know what you're getting. And, and while they make really good stable breeding um for finding a new original cut it's not necessarily going to be in a pack where they all look identical and once again that's not something a lot of people are doing right now dude so Um, eye-opening the the reason you don't see so many large numbers there it also takes a lot of time and money and that's the other thing that a lot of people don't realize is that the expensive seeds a lot of times, and this isn't always, but a lot of times the expensive seeds are expensive for a reason. It's usually because somebody put a lot of time into them. Mm. When you look at some of this stuff in California, especially, some of those lines have been worked in the hills up there for decades, decades. Mm-hmm. And that's why they make amazing parents. That's why they make really good parent stock. Is because they've been bred, they, they, you know what to expect, and you generally know what's going to come out of them. Mm-hmm. Well, we got we got to stop for a second, Terp. It sounds like you okay. just walked into a, a tin can. Is something going on on your side? No, not at all. Okay, now you're back. Sorry, it must have been Zoom. Sorry, F- please continue. Sorry, I cut you off. Oh, you're good. You're good. Um, and that's you know that's really why the stuff coming out of California, a lot of those heirloom varieties and some of those groups that are working stuff out of California, their genetics are a little more expensive but it's worth it as a breeder. Wow. You know, as a breeder, they've done a lot of the work of stabilizing those lines of finding what, you know, what works and what doesn't. And they came from genetics that are, are, are old. You know, they came from old lines that were worked. Never thought hills. about that, man. It's, it's one of those things that those guys in Cali have kind of against the rest of the country is that they've been there doing it for so long. And they have such a variety that they work with that a lot of the stuff that's coming out of California is really genetically awesome. Man, that, and that does answer this question someone was wanting to know about stabilizing F1 and F2. But what was so surprising to me is you say there's really not much of a need to go far beyond that. So that's really interesting you, stuff, man. You can't, I, I don't want to give the impression there's no need. Um, 
it's just at a certain point it can become overkill or diminishing returns. To, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. If you're trying to um, essentially kind of narrow down the gene pool and, and, and remove some of those, that variation um, that's where kind of going into deeper F generations or filial generations makes a difference because um, you can kind of weed out some of the headaches and work around some of the, you know, intersex issues. Um, you know, that's, that's kind of where you can really weed out some of your problems. The problem becomes when you inbreed your plants too far, you really can start to see some depression and some kind of negative issues that arise from that simply because you've, you're inbreeding. That's what's happening when you take a brother and a sister plant, which is right. a, a male and a female from the same line, and you, you bang them together. You're essentially inbreeding at that point. And the more times that you do that down the road, uh, the more likely you are to kind of run into some of those inbreeding problems. Yeah, we all know how that goes with the uh, czar of Russia's hemophiliac son <laughs> and all that. You know what I'm saying? That's Literally, that's, right. how, that's how it was with the like, nobility a long time ago. I, I want to make sure... Genetic. Sorry. Yeah, genetics that's right. Genetics, no matter what we're talking about. That's exactly right, man. Um, listen, we have a bunch of questions. We're not going to get to them all. Let me just fire off the next one. You mentioned open pollination. Someone wants to know what you think about open pollination. And then you're going to have to help me with this acronym here. Can open pollinating and IBL open up different traits? So I think the question is, can open pollinating in an IBL? An IBL is an inbred line. Um, it's essentially a line that's been inbred to the point where they breed true. Um, so essentially you've done those filial generations to the point where almost every one of those plants are going to come out pretty close to identical. Um, the more, the only real need that I see in open pollination is in your earlier filial generations. And I think the question was, can you open pollinate an IBL to get more variation out of it? You yeah. absolutely can. You absolutely can. Um, the problem being that an IBL generally doesn't have much variation in it. So the variation that you may see at that point is probably going to be minimal. Hmm. But yes, in short, if you wanted to open pollinate an IBL, you could draw out other traits in that line that maybe aren't as apparent. Um, I generally, if I'm going to do an, an open pollination, and it's not something I do a lot of, I tend to do it in the earlier generations so that it gives me as much of a selection pool to start with as possible. That way I can really see those really weird variations and kind of take those lines in that direction if that's what I'm looking to do. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. For, for us non-breeders and beginners, open pollination, why does that have an effect on the, oh, the traits like that? An, an open pollination is essentially using multiple males to breed with. So essentially what you're doing is you're pollinating one female with multiple males. And what that does is it gives you the widest variety of those genetics that you can possibly have. And mm. some people may use more than one female. Um, generally speaking, it to me has always meant using more than one male, but I suppose you could just as easily use multiple females. And what it does is it literally just throws the dice as far as they can go. It mm. gives you every possible permutation of genetic variables that you can see so that your first and second selections are literally as wide a population as you can have. Um, it, it's essentially kind of randomizing everything a little bit because it's not as easy to say these traits came from the mom or these traits came from the dad. And that's why it's kind of used in generally in earlier filial generations because what it does is it kind of gives you just as much of a breadth of, of selection as possible. Makes sense. Scatter shot, rolling the Absolutely. dice like you said. We have a question here. Why not uh, put out fem fem lines, feminized seeds from self te self tested crosses? I would love I would love your input on this, and then also maybe talk about the process of making feminized seeds and why you may or may not want to do it. Um, I've 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 generally avoided it. Um, I've, I haven't released publicly any fem seeds. Um, feminization is something that I, I I've watched since it you know first became a real thing in cannabis, kind of in the late nineties. Um, yeah, uh, it's something that I just, I can't offer the same guarantee that I do with my regular seeds. Um, I, I understand Steve's question. Um, there's a lot of breeders that use selfing to essentially be able to kind of dictate what traits their plants are going to pass on. It's a good way of being able to kind of look into the genetics 
and to kind of see what else is there without necessarily having to do large populations. Mm. Um, for me personally, I kind of wish sometimes that's where it ended and that we didn't have so many fem seeds on the market because so many of those end up being bred with. Um, I've seen personally issues with feminization, uh, whether it be extra hermaphroditism, especially in self genetics. Um, when you cross a plant to itself, you increase the chances that if it carries a recessive trait for something, that that recessive trait is going to essentially breed with itself, wow. creating a dominant trait and creating a problem, essentially something like latent hermaphroditism. So it's a lot of your favorite strains, a lot of the, the most popular strains out there are strains that came from seeds that were essentially feminized, whether it's OG Kush, the Chemlines, um, Gorilla Glue, um, you know, there's tons of examples. These are also some of the most wonky breeding genetics that we have. <laughs> they're, they're genetics that have essentially caused a lot of problems in the gene pool as it comes to intersex traits and hermaphroditism. Um, and it, it, to me, it's a great it's a great tool for breeders to use. But I don't know that I feel as confident releasing seeds for people and being able to guarantee those seeds by doing FEMS. And that's why I don't personally release them. Um, I, you know, I don't ever really mind doing the legwork of my own selection and of doing populations. I love that. I understand where selfing and, and by doing fems in certain ways can kind of cut down on some of that time. Um, but like I said, to me as a breeder, it's a tool. It's not necessarily something that I want to put out as an end product. Sure. I mean, I guess you have to be pretty choosy. Um, we have another question asking, why aren't there more autoflower breeders? I would ask you if you would ever get into autoflowers, but it seems like you breeders have a pretty specific lane that you all stick to. Yeah, it's it's a niche of its own. Auto breeding is kind of, um, it's it's kind of a whole thing of its own. It's just not what you do. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's just not what I do. And it's just like fems. Um, there's people out there that I'll admit do it better than I do. It's not something that I have the time, the space, the resources to do and to do properly. Um, I don't really want to do anything half-ass and just kind of throw something together and throw it out there. Uh, I try to put out things that I have a high confidence are going to perform well for mm -hmm. people. And so for me, um, auto flowers are just not something that I have a personal need for in my own garden. And as much as I'd love to just rake in every dollar that's out there, um, I, I feel like I would be doing a disservice to my customers and to the people that I deal yeah. with if I were to just throw my name on something auto flower and put it out there. Um, I don't have a passion for auto flower plants. I, they've always been something in my personal garden that I've kind of tossed out because I, I look for stability. I look for plants that are going to hold and veg and plants that are only going to flower trigger by, by photo period. Mm. Um, so for me personally, it's just something that I've always avoided. Um, it's another thing that I've I've watched that industry kind of come up from, you know, there, there weren't really auto flower plants in the late, late 90s uh, to now it's a whole subsection of, of breeding. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's something that just like I said, if, if I had unlimited space and I had unlimited time and I had unlimited resources that maybe I would look into doing, but the, as it stands, there's just other people out there that do it better. Man, it's it's cool. I like your approach. And we were kind of getting into this off air before the show. You were saying how, you know, and I, this is basically the same advice that I give to a lot of people that want to know how to start a business or how to start a podcast. You were just saying how you focus on your work, you focus on your customers, making your customers happy, building your customer base and providing value, right? And if you just stick to that, the rest kind of falls into place. Yeah, man, to be honest, man, and it kind of comes down to just basic business sense. You know, if you produce a product that people really want, if you make that product affordable and you provide them with the customer service that they would expect from, you know, from anywhere else that they shop, then people are going to come back. Um, I buy hundreds of packs of seeds every year myself. I'm a customer. I, I, I shop with other breeders. I shop with seed banks and I try to provide people with what I would want as a customer. So, you know, customer service, easy answers to questions when I have them, a, a reasonable and affordable price. If beans are more expensive, there's a reason. They've been worked longer. They have more, you know, not necessarily just hype. 
Um, and, and I try to provide to my customers what I would want as a customer. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, you know, like you said, I try to stay in my lane. I try to avoid drama and headaches that aren't related to my business. I try to focus on my customers that consume my product and I try to provide something that's unique. Um, and that's tough in this industry. There's a million breeders right now. There's a million people capitalizing on the fact that seeds are big business. And, you know, I try to provide something that's a reasonable price, but a unique product. Mm. All about it. Terp fiend at Terp fiend. Before we wrap up, I do want to have one, uh, one more question at the end here kind of goes in line with what some people were saying. Some people were wondering when you, when you personally harvest, when you're growing out, uh, buds. So I want to frame it like this, you know, a lot of people take a grower's, I'm sorry, a lot of growers take a breeder's strain and they flower it out. And when they go to harvest, they look for their ratio, usually looking at the trichome heads, a ratio of, you know, amber to cloudy to clear, whatever it may be that their, their specific thing. What do you think about choosing when to harvest as a breeder? I mean, do you want people harvesting your strains like at the given time? You know what I mean? Like how do you feel about harvest windows from a breeder's perspective? I suppose that comes down to what your end goal is. So if your end goal is flower, um, you generally want to make sure your calyxes are done swelling. You want to make sure that you're not producing pissed white pistols still. With some strains that can be tough because you're getting into week 10, 11, 12 sometimes, and you still have, you know, some strains that are just throwing out pistols. But that's another big indicator is once you've kind of started to see more pistol death than you see pistol birth. Um, and then trichom, trichomes are always a big indicator. It looks like, um, it sounds like of, you're looking more at the flower though than getting out there with the mic- microscope. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I really don't start looking at trichomes until the very end, until I've, I'm almost confident that it's time to pull anyway. Um, I look I like as that. much at the, at the plant and how it's developing as I do the actual trichomes because it's not just one thing. Um, you kind of want to take the totality of how the plant is finishing um, and, and kind of let that guide you versus just using one thing. So if you're only looking at trichomes, you're not really taking in the full ripeness of the entire plant. And the other thing is it's always tough to let the entire plant ripen at the same time because with some plants, the tops are always going to ripen better than the lowers. Um, with some plants, they, they all ripen at the same, generally at the same time. Um, so as far as running for flower, uh, you kind of want to take the entire plant, look at the pistol death. You want to look at the calyx swell. You want to look at the trichome development and use all of those as kind of a guide. Now, if you're running for extracts, it can be completely different because with some people, they want to pull extract plants a little earlier so that they get a lighter color oil. Um, some people are fine with, you know, slightly darker colored oil because it generally means more terpenes, more oils, more production. Um, but it really comes down to what your end game is. And then harvesting for seed is a whole different conversation. You know, that generally has more to do with uh, once the plant's pollinated, the entire plant starts to behave differently. It starts to ripen differently. And you're generally waiting to see those seeds completely mature. But as far as flower goes, it's kind of a total package. You want to look at a couple different things and kind of let that be your guide as to when your plants are harvestable. It's the answer that no growers want to hear, but that's really what I tell people is like, you, you'll start to know just by looking at the, especially if you're not under HPS. I love those light correcting glasses because everything looks goofy under HPS, yep. but you, you'll eventually start to know if you can look at your plant under normal light, that's a right plant. That's not a right plant just by looking at the yep. thing, you know? So yeah. 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 And I mean, LED, LED can be a little weird too, just because it's, it's such an odd spectrum for your eyes to look at. I always tell people your best way to tell whether your plants are harvestable or ready, um, pull them into some white light, pull them into something, even if it's just a, you know, 60 watt bulb Mm. so that you're not around that orange red spectrum. And that gives your eyes a little bit better chance to look at what the plant really looks like to kind of take a full stock of the top, the bottom, the middle, the entire area. And then, you know, it once again comes down to what your harvest pattern is. Some people like to take the tops and leave the, the, the lowers to kind of finish sure. out for a little bit, which, you know, it, if your time schedule is right and you have plenty of time and you're not eager to flip that room immediately, that's not a bad strategy. You know, it gives you the chance to let everything kind of harvest up at the same time um, or ripen up at the same time. 
but you know, it, it kind of comes down to your particular situation, kind of where you're growing, how healthy your plants are. Um, that's another kicker that I tell people sometimes unhealthy plants will ripen faster, um, simply because they're struggling and they have kind of stress and they're, at that point, their only goal is to kind of either breed immediately or to finish as quickly as possible. Um, so healthier plants generally are going to take a little bit longer to finish out just because they have all of that time to continue pushing those trichomes, to continue pushing the swell of the calyxes and to kind of push that end stage. Um, so, you know, if, if your plants are kind of showing some wonky growth towards the end, a lot of times they can kind of look a little more ripe than they may actually be. Um, but harvest is one of those weird things. There's not a simple answer. There's not a short, just look at the trichomes kind of answer. Um, to really to really have absolutely right plants, once you think they're ready, give them two more weeks. <laughs> yes, man, you're, you're saying a lot of the same stuff that like Wolfman says in the show. It's, I love the, I love the uh, reinforcement of the stuff. Some of the stuff we've already talked about, give them two weeks. I, I absolutely love it, man. That's it, man. And yeah, I'm, I'm really interested to see how this all progresses and having breeders like you on, having Dr. Coco on and just nailing down this whole end of harvest, end of uh, the plant's life cycle science. Very interesting. Yeah. Terp Fiend. Man, this is incredible. Uh, we're coming to the top of the hour here. Thank you for taking the time. Of course, at Terp Fiend, T-E-R-P underscore F-I three N-D on Instagram. I'm sure many of you listeners already follow him. If you're a new Growcast listener, if you didn't give him a follow before, go follow Terp Fiend to see his awesome lines. Best of luck to you, man. Um, any, any signing off words? Just, just let us know what we can do for you here at Growcast. We love what you're doing. Man, we appreciate you guys, Jordan. Like I said, you've got a you've got an amazing following of people that really, really, really have a passion for growing. Uh, a couple quick shout outs. I want to say what's up to Dr. Green Sky and Cultivated Choice. They're both breeders that I think you've had on, but they're good friends. They're great breeders. They're other people that I support 150%. They're also uh. breeders that support the open source genetics movement. So if you're out there and you're looking for breeders who support people breeding with their seeds and who support the open source genetics of seeds. Um, those are two guys that I, I definitely suggest giving a look to. Dr. Green Sky coming back on the show. You guys can listen. Uh, you guys can look forward to that. And of course, Cultivated Choice with the Katura Kush, the coffee Kush currently running in my garden. What kind of host of the Coffee Health and Science podcast would I be if I didn't grow coffee Kush? And now I'm looking at their coffee and cream line. So we'll see. Very excited to see how that turns out, man. Good people, man. Good people all around. Love it. Shout out to Cultivated Choice. We love Cultivated Choice. Cool merch, too. They have some cool wood stickers. We got to run, though. I could chat all day with Terp. We, we got to call it here. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. Make sure you're subscribed. Rate and review. This is Terp Fiend and Jordan River signing off. Wishing you an extraordinary day. Be safe out there, everyone, and grow smarter. That's our show for today. Thank you so much for tuning in, everyone. Can't thank Terp Fiend enough. Go and show him support. I know you guys will. We sure love Terp Fiend. Shout out to the Grow Pass members. We have an AMA live stream coming up in 10 days. MyGrowPass.com if you want to see what the program is all about. We do appreciate you. We're opening registration shortly. So if you want to get in on these monthly live streams where Wolfman and Rich and I and Rob, we all get together. We wrap. We talk to the members. We follow up with their questions. Make sure they got what they need in their grows. It's how we can give them that personal attention. Love MyGrowPass.com. Thank you so much to all you members. Shout out to Start to Finish Consulting. Start the number two, finish 710 on Instagram for all your consulting needs. Every setup, every situation, we got you covered start to finish. And thank you to Jay Blanked for doing the beat, soundcloud.com slash Blanked. Thanks, everyone. I'll see you next time. Be safe out there. Bye-bye.